um, we have got um, Steve Clement here, Professor Emeritus of Geology. Uh, I'm so thrilled that he's here because he actually hired me along with a few others oh so many years ago. Um, many years. Well, we're 30, I'm ending my 30th year. I'm saying that all year. 30 years. So I really have the privilege to work with a lot of the founding faculty and Steve being one of those. Um, yeah. And we were in the in the old building, the other building, and moved over this building. It's yeah, it's a good good time. Anyway, Steve has always traveled. He taught himself how to play the fiddle. He's all he's still dealing up with the what is it? Symphonicron. Symphonicron with uh, Wayne Mary, and I'm uh, just a very talented person. So you need to ask him some questions other than geology about who he is and what he's done in the past, because uh, it's such a pleasure to have him here today. So Steve, we're going to talk about... Iceland. Good, wonderful. All right, you're on. I've been to Iceland twice, uh, once in, in oh, 2018 and once again last summer. Uh, I've always been on on a ship, uh, a National Geographic ship that's chartered or, or used by Lindblad Expeditions. It's a very small, very expensive operation since there's about 140 people involved. So it, it's very definitely involved in the environment, in natural wonders and, and animals and so on. So. Uh, it's been just a great pleasure to go on, go around Iceland twice. Uh, so I wanted to show you some of the things that maybe the tourists don't see. Uh, some of the geologic stuff that, that we can see and find out about uh, Iceland. And so first of all, of course, to look at the location, you know, we say, where is it? Well, it's way up there on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And that's, there are very, very few places in the world that are on a, the actual rift, one of the geologic rift zones. And Iceland is one of those spots. The other is over around in Ethiopia, which we, if we have time, we'll look at. Anyway, see if I can make this work. Uh, Steve, I'm going to share the screen. I forget how to do Zoom. I'm sorry, folks. Oh. I forget how to do it. All right. You're not on Zoom. Uh, anyway, Iceland is. On the Mid Atlantic Ridge, you can see coming up the dark line at the center. And there's a red spot in the middle of Iceland. This is a so called hot spot. Around the Earth, there are roughly 30 places that are called hot spots. They're unusually hot with a, a plume of heat coming up from the mantle or convection coming up from the mantle. And so, for example, Hawaii is. The classic hot spot where you have a uh, volcanic rock here in the middle of the Pacific plate. Uh, and that the reason it's there is because of some sort of a plume. Iceland, that red spot in the middle of Iceland, is the Iceland plume where it's unusually hot uh, and rising. We good? Yeah, you're proud. Okay. Uh, so Iceland sits there. Uh, these are earthquakes. Oh, last, Mar uh, last May, I think it's two weeks of earthquakes or a week of earthquakes. Nothing's, they always have earthquakes. They have hundreds of earthquakes all the time. It's not a big deal. It's, it's not the kind of thing we read about in, in San Andreas where buildings are falling down and cracking and people are getting killed. These are ones and twos and threes, maybe some fours and an occasional five, but there are earthquakes all the time. As, as of course, the mid Atlantic Ridge comes up the Atlantic, you can see it here, comes up, goes into Iceland on the right, right James Ridge here. We'll look at this area in particular. It goes around here, some of it goes up a little bit, and splits across, it comes around and it leaves Iceland and goes up into the Arctic up that way. So it's very obvious that we are right smack on the mid Atlantic Ridge. It's spreading about seven meters a year, about an inch a year in different places, not all of us. Uh, in the early days of plate tectonics, when people were just learning about plates to start with, starting in the late 50s and really 
going on in the 1960s and 70s, people began looking at the magnetism of the magnetic inclinations of the igneous rocks all over the world. One of the places that was studied in particular was right below Iceland here. And of course, illustrations like this indicate that the red rock here, let's just say is yesterday's rock. And on both sides of it, there's a yellow band that might be last week's rock. And outside of that, there's the green, the blue, and the purple, and so on. And so the idea of plate tectonics and spreading was brand new. This You don't have any clue about how amazing this was. What an amazing uh, turn of events it was to go back to the old thinking when the ocean floors were just abyssal plains and nothing happened at all. All of a sudden you're cracking these things and moving continents. I mean, the thought was just amazing to me about plate tectonics. So uh, this was a pattern. There was another one further south around the Azores, which is called, was, was Project Famous, F-A-M-O-U-S, which is French-American mid-ocean undersea study, I think it was. That was really the first. They went down with submersibles, Alvin and uh, Woods Hole was involved in Columbia and other places where they actually sampled the rocks and, and saw the hot water and the, uh, all that coming out from these vents, which was an amazing discovery. Uh, the oldest rock that I can find the older reference is up there 16 and a half million. So Iceland is really very young. Uh, and we've got three, three colors here. There's, there's this purple, which is the youngest, flanked by the greens here, and then flanked by this, these plates outside here. We'll look at some of these. We'll look at this area and, uh, and a couple of places here. But the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, starts in here. That's the capital right there, right? starts in here and then it kind of dissipates. And uh, there's sort of a transform fault section right in there. And it starts up again as a spreading center with normal faults and some strike slip movement along these various places. At the bottom, this orange color is uh, sand, the basaltic sand. The color isn't, of this isn't very good, but it's there. Uh, we just, if we concentrate on the center part, this purplish, and these are the volcanoes, many of, there are many, many, many more, but these are some of the significant volcanoes. You see, this is the active area. And we look at Iceland as a geothermal place. They're incredible. They produce their own electricity. They have no they have total resource. They are talking about building an undersea cable to export electricity to England, which is just mind boggling. The, the price and so on is just absurd. But nevertheless, you can drill a hole almost anywhere and come up with two and three and 400 degree hot water, which is what they do. So Iceland is really self-sufficient in terms of certainly electrical energy. They have to bring in gasoline and diesel because they have ships, they have bus, they have buses, they have trains, or no trains, you know, cars and all that kind of industry. But almost all of their electro, electricity is, is coming from different sources here. We'll look at two of them. Uh, hydro is the biggest power. Somewhere around 2006, seven and eight, there was a big increase in the usage and the demand for electricity. And uh, there's one industry that requires huge amounts of electricity. Iceland electricity is running about 30% lower than most of the world. It's cheap electricity. And there's a couple of industries that will go anywhere in the world for cheap electricity. And that industry is the aluminum industry. Uh, between, between making aluminum foil and the, and the smelting of aluminum, plus 
ferrosilicon. Ferrosilicon is made from iron ore and quartz sand fused into this ferrosilicon, which is used as an alloy in steel. Uh, you make, there is three or four different varieties of levels of, of uh, silicon in there, but it's at, it's, uh, you don't pour quartz into molten steel. You make ferrosilicon and get it, get the silicon in there anyway. So we have uh, an amazing use of aluminum. That true aluminum smelters from all over the world. The US industry is basically dead. They always went to hydroelectric because it was cheapest, but there used to be aluminum refineries near Niagara Falls in Messina, New York. Uh, there were up in the Cascade, up in the Pacific Northwest, Wenatchee, Washington had refineries from that power. But most of this is gone now. The town of Alcoa in Tennessee uh, was there because of the Tennessee Valley, the TVA authority was hydroelectric, but Iceland and Norway and, and uh, Scandinavia beats them all. So they will take the aluminum ore from anywhere in the world, Jamaica, South America, the Pacific, and take it to these places to refine, to smelt. Uh, let's look at a couple of these. The one up on the right, hydroelectric, big deal. It, it's taking meltwater from the glacier, the Vatnajoko glacier. It's dammed up some beautiful, beautiful valleys uh, and sent that water through tunnels, bored tunnels through the basalt down to an underwater generator plant. There, the water drops about a thousand feet, so that by the time it hits that generator, it has huge potential force behind it, a great deal of push into that power station, which is underground, and then uh, high voltage transmission lines that have to be secured from avalanches over to over to Alcoa. This is a typical aluminum smelter around the world. You will see rows, you'll see, you'll see long skinny buildings. And in those, those are called pot lines, or in those buildings, there is a, there will be a container like this, rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of them. And in that, Aluminum oxide or corundum, you know, from uh, Mohs scale of hardness, number nine, corundum, aluminum oxide, uh, is what goes in and what comes out is liquid molten aluminum. Uh, and so the secret to this whole thing is a mineral or a compound now, it's all made synthetically, but was the, there's a mineral called cryolite. It's a, it's a weird, rare mineral it has been mined out, it's gone. The, the main mine came from the south west corner of Greenland, Ivig Tut, Greenland. Uh, it's gone. If you look at Ivig Tut on Google Earth, there's a circular lake. That was the mine, it's simply the stuff is gone. There may be a few samples around here and there, but cryolite melts at around <coughs> 900 degrees Celsius. Aluminum melts at around 2000 degrees Celsius. So you do not melt alumina or uh, corundum and make aluminum, you have to, but it dissolves in molten cryolite. And so you pour powdered aluminum oxide into basically molten cryolite, apply electric current, Big electric current. It's low voltage. It's it's direct current. It's around less than five volts, but huge amperage. And the carbon, the graphite electrodes, of course, combines with the oxygen here and goes off as gas. That's the problem with this technique. You're producing CO2 and 
a lot of it, but nevertheless, you're getting molded aluminum. This is the whole Harold process. It goes back to 1886, and it hasn't been changed since. It's, it's the only economic process to produce aluminum. Uh, so it's environmentally, it's not good because of all the CO2 that's produced. They're, they try to trap it, but it's still CO2. Uh, so uh, you have you have these so-called pot lines. Every every aluminum refinery or smelter they call it looks like this. Rows and rows of these. It doesn't require any many many workmen. You know, I wanted to see things like the Winnie Willy Wonka uh, candy factory with with pistons and arms and things and buckets of molten stuff. No. There's nothing to look at. Look at the other end of Iceland, down in Reykjavik, and we have a couple of aluminum smelters, and somewhere around here is the ferrosilicon smelter there. And this is a this is the biggie one. This is Telescheidi, I think it's called. When I first looked at this, I thought, there's a volcano. You know, this, this is a crater of some sort. I thought that might be the middle of it, but when you get on Google Earth and look straight down on it, it's on the side. But this definitely is a volcanic vent. And you can see this is a road, of course, but these things are pipes. They're insulated water pipes that are coming in from all over into this geothermal electric plant. Uh, look at a different view. They're all they feed in from all over the place from, from the distance. And the next the next view is even better with the snow. Uh, they have about 30 wells. Oh, did I do that? Yeah. Uh, the water is coming in very hot. It's under pressure until it gets there. So it's confined. It's, it's above boiling, definitely above boiling. So when it, it's coming in from all directions, way out here in the distance, there are about 30 wells that feed this particular plant. And there are plants like this all over a lot of Iceland. Uh, and the superheated water flashes into steam. And of course, the steam is taken off through a turbine which runs a generator which provides electricity. Very simple. The problem is, of course, there's water, there's condensate. There's water that doesn't flash or the water that uh, collects. And so that's re-injected down in. I read recently, just a couple of days ago, uh, about a number of small earthquakes that are that have occurred around this plant. When you're pulling stuff out of the ground and pushing it back into the ground, you're disturbing. You're disturbing the the ground. Uh, so there are there are some seismographs that are set up there uh, to detect and warn. Nothing is much more than a want. I mean, it's like we feel the coal trains going by, don't we? We feel those little tremors or the, the big garbage truck that goes by. You know, that's, that's the kind of thing that they sometimes feel. Anyway, mostly they're like this, these power plants. There was one in sort of southern Iceland that was having a problem disposing of the water. And they decided it was filled with, that kept clogging up. It didn't go down very well. And so they decided to try to build a big pond and let the water percolate through the, through the porous basalt. It's, it's, a, it's vesicular, it's fractured, it's cracked and so on. So there's porosity through this basalt. And they tried to make a big pond and spread this water out and hope it would percolate through. This plant, uh, 
And it didn't work very well. This was in the late 70s, early 80s. And somebody went in it and said, this is cool. <laughs> and so it got developed into probably the biggest tourist attraction in Iceland. It's called the Blue Lagoon. Uh, and this is, you have to say it's wastewater from the geothermal power plant, which is, you can see where the steam is up in the upper left. Uh, Google says, it must be right, of course. Uh, <laughs> the pH is 7.7, .7, slightly alkaline. I, I suspect it's more than that. Uh, most of these springs and, and geothermal things are. Uh, it's loaded with colloidal silica and blue-green algae. Uh, the temperature they keep, they say that it's around 100 Fahrenheit, so it's a nice warm bath. Uh, you can see, and uh, <laughs> it's just not, uh, not the greatest. Oh, this smells of hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell. And Google said the other day, you smell it, but after a while you don't notice it. And, you know, it, that's, that stinks. It's you know, not, I don't think that's fun. I've not been there. <laughs> and I don't plan on going. You'll see a couple of people here. There's three people here with white stuff on their faces. There's a person there, I think, with white stuff. The picture, the color here doesn't show terribly well. But they sell, I don't know whether it's zinc oxide or what, but they sell some stuff you could put on, especially if you have long hair. You can coat your hair with some sort of a gel, which will keep the silica and other stuff out of it. There are stories about women with long hair having to wash their hair four and five times to get rid of the uh, silica particles and so on come from the water. Uh, Google also said it costs something like $64 to, for admission. Uh, not my cup of tea. Uh, and it's you know, not very deep, about four feet deep. There's no swimming. You, there's not a person here with their face in the water. Uh, they're just standing there. This is a bar over on, over on the right hand side there. But, uh, it, it's a huge tourist attraction. It's, it's just a short distance off the road between the airport and the capital, between Keflavik and Reykjavik. So it's perhaps the biggest uh, tourist attraction in Iceland. The next one is another tourist. Oh, this is good. Uh, Reykjavik is some of their main streets, like this one in the middle here, is heated in the winter with steam pipes. It melts the snow under the street, under the sidewalk. Pretty darn cool to have that much excess energy kicking around in Iceland. Uh, and we're looking. The next, the next uh, big tourist attraction is down here where I've circled here. It's right on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and it is called Thingvillir. Uh, it's, it's very important in Icelandic history. Uh, obviously it's a rift zone, big one. Uh, the parking lot, you park up here. And there's the, the usual gift shop, the entrance, the ticket booth, and displays and all that kind of thing. And then you start down, you start down, down this path into this rift zone. Uh, it's impressive, there's no question. Uh, there are signs, or there used to be, I haven't been there. Uh, and they took some flack about it, I understand, but you know, it used to say on your one side. You're looking at North America and on the other side is Europe. So you're in this rift zone. And, and uh, where do you draw that line? There are zillions of places where there are fractures. Uh, and one side is on the North American side and one side is on the European side or is facing Europe. Uh, but that's what it is. And so 
go down further. This is important in Iceland history. Uh, it was down in here somewhere in 930. The heads of the, I don't know whether, what the word is, tribes or different communities got together and, and formed the first uh, Congress or the first uh, General Assembly, I guess we can call it. And since then, apparently they met ever since uh, down in this hole somewhere here and uh, decided things. And uh, eventually the, the, the body is called the Althingi and they moved into Reykjavik in, in a, indoors, but meeting out here where it was the difficult. You can see here, people going in both directions. That means they parked up at the top. Uh, it's all basalt. Here they're all going in the same direction. This suggests that they're coming out of buses and the buses dump them up at the top and they walk down and the buses pick them up down at the bottom. They've been there on, they've been there. They say they've been there. I don't know what we saw. We just have been there. That, that's <laughs> the typical tourist, you know. Uh, so they've been to Iceland and they've been to uh, this, this particular rift zone. No one looks terribly interested in it. <laughs> this is thing we here. Uh, then we want to go, I want to go. It's pretty neat. This is from one of the viewpoints. It's a, it's a picture off the internet. Something's going on out here. And if you go on Google Earth and look down on it, of course, very obviously, there are a whole series of fractures where we have normal folding, we have robins, down drop blocks pulling apart all through this area. If you could remove the vegetation and remove the water and remove whatever glacial deposits there are, it might look something like this. This is in Ethiopia, which is the other place in the world where a rift zone is crossing uh, continental type material. Ethiopia is pulling apart uh, quite well. Now we're going to move, move to the glacier over here. The Vatna Yoko Glacier, they say is averages 400 meters thick, 1,200 feet. That's, that's, that's a lot of ice. You know, that's just not a little snow field. That's a good ice field. And it, it goes to a max of about a thousand feet or a thousand meters thick. So, um, and we have, a, we have a volcano underneath it, Grimsvold. Oops, there, that's where I want to go. Um, there's a good volcano that erupts fairly, or, yeah, it erupts fairly often. There's another one up in here somewhere. There's another one over here. So this isn't the only place, but let's go around. The Glacial Lagoon is a tourist place. It's a meltwater, it's a meltwater place. It's been dammed by the road. Route one goes across there. And so tourists, stop here and uh, go out in this glacial lagoon, take pictures of the floating ice and come back and I've seen that. Uh, this is what they go out in. They use war surplus, Vietnam, uh, they're called larks. Uh, and they were, it was meant to transport material from shore to ship or ship to shore loaded with cargo. And of course, Iceland has these. I think they were made by Westinghouse. And uh, put, I count 10 or 11 life jackets there. And on the other side, there's six. So they'll take about 24 people out for, I don't know, half an hour and go around floating ice, take pictures of black ice, blue ice, white ice. Uh, we didn't get anywhere near the, the, the face of the glacier itself. Uh, this time, my second trip, we were very, very careful to avoid people. Everyone was masked and, and um, boosted and vaccinated and so on. So we really didn't want to go out 
in places like this. So we went a couple of miles down the road to a different glacial lagoon and went out in Zodiacs. I think it was eight people in a Zodiac. So you were just had four people beside you and across from you. You knew every you knew everyone off the same ship. So we were all clean, hopefully, and it worked beautifully. Now, it got much closer to the ice, and I think we got a much better uh, idea of what this stuff looked like. Let's go back to go back to uh, these features. The writing tells it all. Uh, when you have a volcano erupting underneath a thousand feet of ice, you end up with this blob of water underneath the glacier. And it builds and builds and builds and builds until, bam, someday it lets out with a great glacial outburst flood, which they, a, a Icelandic word, the Yokola, uh, bursts out and floods with the uh, normal glacial outwash, just the normal sedimentary stuff. And you can see that, oops, going the wrong direction here. This is route one. This is the main road around Iceland. And uh, routinely it wipes, it wipes it out when you have these things. So it's, it's an impressive event. And that dictates kind of what the southern coast of Iceland is, is all these sheets of, uh, we'll call it sedimentary, uh, derived uh, fine grain basaltic material spread out. Uh, on the surface of the ice, when one of these happens, you know, the bottom is dropping out, the bottom is empty, and so we'll have these caldera, I guess we'll call them calderas, these collapse features on top of the ice sheet with, with concentric cracks. And here's another uh, beautiful one a couple of years ago. I might mention if any of you think about going back to, or going to Iceland, the Icelandic Met Office uh, is the place to start with. It has daily earthquakes, it has road conditions, it has weather, it has uh, all, all kinds of information about Iceland and it's every day it's up there. The Iceland, it's a meteorological office but it's usually, if you go on your computer and go Iceland Met Office, you'll find it. Uh, it is the place to start. Uh, there's melt, there's melt water coming down. This is normal melt water coming down off the ice over unconsolidated fine grain basaltic sediment. You have some gorgeous graded drainage coming down. Uh, you know, unconsolidated, fine grain, uniform material, except perhaps way over on the right hand side here where there, where there are some walls. But that's pretty. Uh, this is what it looks like, this, this area, what it looks like uh, from above. They've done a good job, some of the landowners, of building building dikes or walls to keep this from spreading. And so there's some gorgeous, gorgeous farmland in southern Iceland around these areas uh, because it's, I mean, all the nutrients are there. It's, they grow a, a lot of hay because they have, of course, sheep and horses and, and animals to keep up year round. Uh, it's a short growing season. We'll look at one other thing here. That has to do with a little bit about the climate of Iceland. Uh, we think the word, of course, implies it's just awful, but it's not. Uh, because part of Iceland, this is the Gulf, this is the tail end of the Gulf Stream. And so the, a little bit of southern Iceland just gets brushed by the, the tail end of the Gulf Stream. The other, the north end up here, often gets the Greenland current, which is, of course, much, much colder. So Iceland has a pretty decent climate. Uh, 
we were looking earlier. I don't think the slide made it on this version, but the temperatures of the cities, I looked at it, this was from this morning. The temperatures of most of the coastal cities were minus one or two degrees Celsius, which is putting it in the high 20s for us, like last week here. Uh, up in up in the high up up in the highlands, it was getting down to eight and ten Celsius below. Uh, but it's not that bad because of the Gulf Stream. But I want to show you some engineering. We'll look at a couple of towns up here. And what they do, we have avalanches. Uh, we'll look here at Bill Dudelar, which is right in there. We we'll have a nice fjord. And this is, these are called, this is the east, this is the east, uh, east fjords, and over there are the west fjords. Uh, you know, this is looking up that area. The town we're going to look at is right around the corner here, Bill Dudelar. You see flat line, beautiful flat line of salt, beautiful country. The town, most of these small towns have two or 300 people. Uh, their primary livelihood probably is fishing. Uh, but you can see they've built a sort of a, a big triangle of, of material just to, just to guide avalanches out to sea. It's more important in this little town, Flattery, Flattery, don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, once again, beautiful basalt, flatline basalt. Uh, in the town, there is this structure facing uphill. And there it is. Uh, in 1995, an avalanche, avalanche killed and buried 45 people, 20 of whom died. Uh, and in a, a near town over, Sudovic, it, it killed, I think, 12 people. Uh, and so Iceland all of a sudden came up with some funds to build these structures. Uh, and that's what this is. You can see that there are lumps underneath, down below all of these gullies. These are mostly filled with rock. Uh, of course, covered in snow in this picture, but we have all kinds of rock slides or debris flows coming down of these gullies, as well as avalanches. They could have built this a little wider on the left-hand side, because in 2000, they had a very, very big avalanche. And you can see the left side kinds of directs the flow right smack into the harbor. And uh, I think I think it was five or six of their seven fishing boats that happened to be moored there uh, were either damaged or sunk because of the avalanche. So very, very serious situation in some of these towns where I'm sure living is not easy. The next town over. I can get going in the right direction. Yeah, Blue Line Garvik. It's kind of interesting. Up top, there's a row of eight lumps. And then you can see a, a barricade of sorts. These, these are called breaking mounds. They're, they're wire mesh faced. They break up the avalanche and it's caught by what they call a catching dam down below. We are used to thinking in terms of scale. And uh, you know the spacing of these tire tracks uh, tells us this is a pretty big, pretty big structure. These 40, 50 feet high. They, have a, they all have a fence on top to keep animals or people from going over the steep edge. And we'll finish up. We have 10 minutes here. We want to. I want to go down here uh, to the eruption that happened. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead here. Iceland does an incredible job of instrumentation. These triangles are seismic stations. 
the circles are GPS stations. So from a little place like FAF, uh, they get information on, on sensors, uh, elevation, position, all, all, and it's very, very sensitive. There's a similar setup where the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge leaves Iceland up at the north edge, a, a real, real uh, conglomeration of scientific instruments. Several different outfits own these and operate them as a university. It's also uh, Czechoslovakia has a has a seismic system in here. How that how that happened, I don't have any idea, but it's there. So there's a whole lot of data you can access, as I did for about a year. The seismic, the, the tremors in FAF here, which I have if you want to see them. Um, back a year ago, uh, Iceland gets information from a satellite that's apparently in polar orbit. So it goes over Iceland quite frequently. They get a lot of good information. Uplift and down dropping February 24, 27. And they knew something was going to happen. Uh, everything was going along very calmly with tremors of a one or two. And then on the 24th of February, a 5.7 earthquake. So one of these green stars uh, is one of those. And then the tremors started in terms of numbers and intensity. And it began, they knew Magma was moving. It was shaking the ground. They knew something was going on. It hadn't, it hadn't erupted yet, but they knew Magma was getting closer to the surface and it was coming up and shaking. Uh, this is two weeks later in March. The number of earthquakes, our number of the tremors are still very high. There was another earthquake in there. And on the 19th of March, we had the eruption. Uh, people couldn't stay away. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. These are mostly locals. I mean, this is, at that time of year in February or March, March 19th, 20th, there aren't too many tourists there, although it's becoming more and more in the winter, all time. Uh, but anyway, there are people everywhere. There, there's no path, there's no road, there's no anything. Uh, they're stumbling over wet, loose rocks with, covered with moss. So it wasn't for the faint of heart. But when you got there, it was fantastic. A beautiful little cone. They warned people to keep your backs to the wind, as, as one should, because of the gases. They're, they're sulfur, fluorine, and chlorine gases. Especially the fluorine is just nasty. Uh, sulfur, equally so. They warn people not to bring children or dogs because they're low to the ground. Dogs would tend to drink out of puddles. Children probably won't, but uh, you'll get uh, hydrofluoric acid, sulfuric acid, and all that in the water. So uh, that was advice. Uh, here it is three weeks later, and you can see the lava has grown quite a lot. They didn't, they didn't have to warn people to stay away <laughs> when it was a thousand Celsius. You, you kind of do. Uh, this is obviously in a fissure right here. It started here, which you just saw, and, and went here and by April 7. They weren't sure what was going to happen in here. This comes from the AMO, the Appalachian, or the uh, Iceland office. Uh, we'll look at this upper one. It, start, it started here, moved here, ended down in here. This is pretty neat video. Obviously, it's a fissure right there, the crack. It's not a central vent like we read about. This is photography from a drone. It's so incredible. The 
the lava is building itself a natural levee as it crystallizes on the edges. It, it's almost confining itself to its, to its root. As the outside crystallizes and hardens, it's stuck in that channel. I like the topography. There's not a tree in sight. It's rugged and beautiful. Now, we have one, one last. This started here. We just saw this running down there. It ended in there, and it ended up like this. The eruption officially ended, on, I think it was the 18th of September, and they wait 90 days before they say it's over, and they just did that in December. So it officially, this eruption is over. You can see, or at the end, you had eruptions like this, and then maybe a day and a half would go by and nothing happening, no tremors, no eruption, and then it would have a burst, and then it would sit for a day and a half or so. And it went on, it went like that for a couple of weeks at least. You see, it's driven by gas. There's a chunk right here, it's going to fall in. <laughs> and of course, we have lots of gas coming up. Now, the, the newspapers will call it smoke. We uh, know that. Uh, we, we know it's not. Here, and as I look at this, you know, we have a row of cones. It kind of reminds me of. Craters of the Moon National Monument in Idaho, where you have a row of cones like this. Not exactly, but we're almost done with this. But for those of you who are in the department or, or planning or thinking of majoring, this is the kind of stuff you could have for, it's a lifetime of seeing things that other people don't or don't understand. It's, it's, and you've got this information with you forever. Wherever you go, you can find something interesting. And that's so cool. Anyway, thank you. A few questions. I want to take, want to take this game, Matt. <laughs> you have done, William Mary has done so well yeah. with the masks. I'm so impressed. Do they have a question for Steve? Question for Steve? Yeah, sure. Um, so oh, yeah. I visited Iceland in 2019. Yes. So made it before the pandemic. Um, but when I was in the northern part of the country, no. um, near, uh, I guess it was the uh, thermal plant. Yes. Um, there was like a really loud. It almost sounded like a jet engine. Yes. Um, do you have any answers as to what I was hearing? Probably it was one of those flash steam plants where superheated water is allowed to burst into steam. And it probably was that kind of a situation. They are, I, I have a feeling from the several I've been here, they're, they're noisy. Uh, and with this, Roar and steam. Yeah. I think that's it. Did you enjoy it? I think. Yeah, it was so cool. I would love to go back again. <laughs> so, Rick is saying, great program, Steve. Oh. From Rick and Karen. Pablo Yana says, can we get video of Steve again? So. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I love Iceland, obviously. Yeah. I go there. I go to the Iceland Met office at Steve. The meteorological, but, but now it's just an open net office. Go there every day, I do for the last two years. I think looking at earthquakes, looking at eruptions, and reading some of the things that are going on in Iceland. Fascinating. The population is like 350,000 people, like the size of Richmond, probably. 
and they're all spread out in this small place. But geologically, it's fascinating because of the rip itself and all the stuff that goes with it. So that's what really makes it kind of special. That really is special. Any more questions for Steve before we say goodbye? What? There's one in there faster. So, Steve, can you say anything about CO2 sequestration in Iceland? Oh. Yeah, there's a company. There's a company that's about five or six years old called Carb Fix, and they are trying to. The process is simple. They're trying to dissolve the CO2 in water, pumping it down into this particular basalt, and hoping it will take the calcium from the rocks. And, and make calcite, C A C A C A C O three. Yeah, make calcite, and it's working. It takes a couple of years, but it works. But it's a very slow, difficult kind of process. There's another process that's just developing called Cl Climb Works, which is nearby, and they're trying to take C O two from the atmosphere through filters, and then somehow get the carbon CO2 off those filters into the carb fix um, CO2 uh, injection into the rocks. It's, it's they're nice ideas. You have to have the right host rock. You, know? you just can't do this sticking it into sandstone, I don't think. And so it's very limited. There also it uses a huge amount of fresh water. They're experimenting using salt water because they, there's the salt everywhere on the ocean floor down there. And so the idea is there, but all these obstacles, the, the price, the slowness of the whole process, and the possible, and using up the fresh water is a real, a real uh, problem. It is. It is. Uh, so Pablo said to you, Steve, Iceland also qualified a soccer team for the World yes. Cup. Yeah. With a population, a fraction of the Virginia Beach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sports are very big. Virginia Beach is slapping. <laughs> 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 All right, now let's thank Steve. Oh, we'll stay after and uh, talk to Steve. Absolutely. If you've got time, I know some people need to have a